Shigali, everybody. Welcome back to our winter storytelling series called A Time for Listening, Sharing, and Connecting. I really hope that you enjoyed our very first episode with Kathy Absalon and Stories from the Bush and that you were like me and felt very inspired to create a relationship with the land and the natural world around us. Um, Kathy's words were so inspiring um, and she's such a beautiful person and I hope that you were able to take something away um, from that episode. So I'm really excited to be welcoming our very second guest. Uh, his name is Clarence Kakaji, and he's going to be sharing some stories of resilience and stories from his past. Um, and he is such a wonderful human, and Kitchener Waterloo is so lucky to have him. Um, and I'm really looking forward to sitting down with him and sharing stories. Um, if this is your first time watching, then um, I'll introduce myself as well. So my name is Alana Jewell, and I'm Bear Clan from Oneida Nation of the Thames. So I'm an artist, I'm a community organizer, I organize art markets in the city, um, and I'm also the Parks Engagement Associate for the City of Kitchener. So in this role, I decided that I wanted to put on a winter storytelling series because I really missed, you know, culture and sitting in a circle with an elder or a knowledge keeper and learning from them, but because of COVID, we can't do that. So I thought, you know, it would be such a good idea to sit down and do the sharing just virtually so that anyone can watch um, and a huge special thank you to the Kitchener Public Library for partnering with me on this. Um, your help is so appreciated and um, I'm really hoping that people feel connected and that they really look forward to this every two weeks. Um, we're going to be sitting down with a total of six uh, Indigenous knowledge keepers, elders and storytellers um, until April 21st. So I'm really hoping that you're enjoying the series and that you're keeping up uh, with it. And yeah, thank you so much. I'm just going to share a little bit about Clarence. Um, and then we'll dive right into um, sharing stories. So Clarence is from Waterloo Region and he has an undeniable spirit for change. With a primary focus on working with the spirit within, he is a helper, a visionary, and an author who's known for investing his whole self into his community. Clarence originates from Chapelot Cree First Nation and calls Cambridge his home. He has faced his fair share of struggles and chooses to serve and support those living on the margins of society. So Clarence is wonderful, and like I said, um, Kitchener-Waterloo is very lucky to have him. I hope that um, post-COVID we can all come together and we can meet these um, great people, um, knowledge keepers, uh, storytellers, and that um, you're either meeting these people for the first time and feeling that connection, or you're seeing a familiar face from our community. So either way, I really hope that you're enjoying the series, and again, thank you so much for your support, um, and enjoy. Wache, ane, bujou, sego. Thanks for joining us today for these winter stories. Um, I think it's great that we can get together and enjoy this time together. Uh, my name is Kiwe Tinwe in the Ne. That translates into North Wind Man. My other name is Clarence Kakaji. I'm from Fox Lake Reserve, Chapel Cree First Nation. Bear Clan, and I'm a beautiful person. I would just like to. Um, invite you to join me near this fire. I want to open open up our time together. And then I'm going to sing a song. I'm Kiwe Tinwa in the neck from the people of the Meshkegoa, Fox Lake Reserve, Chapel Creek First Nation, Bear Clan. And I'm a beautiful person. I'd like to give thanks for this day. I'd like to give thanks for the air that I breathe the food that I eat, and the beautiful people that are in my life. I'd like to acknowledge the territories that we're on, of the Haudenosaunee, the Neutral, and the Anishinaabe. I ask that the ancestors of those nations be with us today. I put this tobacco down for the ones who are lost, for the ones who are broken, and for the ones who are still finding their way. I put this tobacco down for the ancestors and all that they've done in order for us to be here today. I put this tobacco down for the spirit of COVID. And I put this tobacco down for the ones who are suffering, and the ones who are being challenged with grief. The whole. I'm gonna sing a song, and the song that I'm gonna sing, it's a, it's a thank you song. It was gifted to me by my friend Hilton King, and his daughter Christine gifted it to him. The song is saying thank you to the Creator for everything that Mother Earth gives us. 
as I sing this song, let's think about all those beautiful things creation of Mother Earth gives us to sustain life and to feed our spirits. tobacco tie here and I'm just going to virtually offer um, Clarence some tobacco as a way to ask that he'll participate in our winter story session. 
Um, and this is typically what you do when you're giving an offering to someone and you want to ask uh, a request of someone. So I have my tobacco tie here and it was given to him. Um, and it's another way also to say thank you for participating and being willing to share knowledge um, and teaching. So thank you, Clarence. Thank you. Did you see how that worked? Okay. You offered it. I got it. That's, Amazing. that's how tobacco works. It, uh, yeah. it, it's one of our four sacred medicines. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Yeah, I'm really <laughs> thankful we could do that because COVID makes it really hard to be able to offer tobacco to people and, you know, you, you don't get close to people. So I'm, I'm thankful that um, Nikki was able to help us there and you were able to, to get tobacco. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So I was just, uh, I wanted to say after, after I sang that song about the drum, I wanted to just talk a little about, about a little bit about the drum. The beat of the drum represents the heartbeat of Mother Earth. And when we sing and when we play the drum, it's a form of prayer. So it was an honor for me to, to open up our time together with a song and, and to sing. And the drum keeps us connected. It keeps us connected to, to culture. It keeps us connected to creation. And, uh, and with that being said, let's, uh, let's move on with our, uh, our time together. So as I shared before, my name is Clarence Kakaji. And I've been visiting this beautiful, beautiful part of creation for, uh, I think, about 53 years. I, uh, I'm not from here. I'm from a little bit up north, about, uh, it's about 10 hours, 11 hours, the way the crow flies, uh, which is uh, Chaplow. I'm from Fox Lake Reserve, Chaplow Creek First Nation. That is the place that I am connected to. That is um, where my roots come from. And uh, I'm half Cree and I'm half settler. Uh, my the other the other half of me is uh, I have some Swedish in me. Mm -mm. I have some Irish and some Scottish. And all that stuff put together um, makes this beautiful person. I always have to keep telling myself that that I'm a beautiful person because because I am and, and we're all beautiful people. You know, um, with that being said, we, we all we're all on different paths. We all come different. We all come from different families, and um, we're from different nations. And maybe our skin is different. Maybe it's a different color. Uh, but deep down inside, you know, we're we're all the same. We all still have that that same blood. We all have the same organs, and and that keeps us connected. And that's that's my views today, right? Um, that I want to share that. Yes, I'm indigenous and, and I'm I'm doing my best to to stay connected to my culture and, and ceremonies and and to to be the helper that I can be. And with that being said, I also want to form relationships with with people from the other nations and and from from the other places around around the world, you know. Uh, with that, I'm gonna light this candle to represent the fire. And what fire gives us and how fire gives us life and and how fire helps us to cook and how fire the fire brings us together you know i was i wanted to share a bit more outside uh but uh due to unforeseen circumstances uh that wasn't quite possible so we brought the fire inside and i'm watching it and I'm tending the fire, and um, and that's that's one of my roles. And uh, we we have the water here, so you know, and we have the four sacred medicines and a couple objects that I'll talk about later. So who am I? I am Kiwe Tenway in the Nay, and I'm also Clarence Kakaji, and. I live in this region and I call this region home. This is where I have a sense of belonging and this is where I feel connected to. And this is where I want to invest my time. It wasn't always like that. It wasn't always like that. I didn't um, I didn't know where I came from. 
identity was a big, big thing. Loss of identity was a big thing for me. And my story, it doesn't start with me. It starts with with um, my parents. It starts with my ancestors. It starts many, many generations before me. Um, so with that being said, uh, my grandmother was in the residential schools. My father was in the residential schools. My aunts were in the residential schools. My uncles were in the residential schools. It's had a horrific impact on, on, on my family and other families, you know, in, um, in Canada and, and the boarding schools in, um, in the United States and, and all that stuff. And, and I'm the first generation on my father's side that was actually able to come home after school. I struggled in school. I was, uh, I'm part of the 60 scoop. And my sister and myself, we were displaced at a very young age. We were put into the care of the Children's Aid Society. We were moved around to a couple, to a couple um, families who thought they might want to foster us. And we were even adopted once. And then in time, we were put back into the system. And then I ended up, we ended up um, on a farm outside of Kitchener Waterloo and we stayed with that family I stayed for 13 years and my sister stayed for about 10 or 11 and I consider those those people that raised us and uh, I consider them my my family and I consider them my parents it was hard growing up it was challenging growing up um, you know, I struggled uh, with learning how to talk. I had a speech impediment. My, my sister, who's two years older than me, she would always be the interpreter to, uh, to, um, to decipher uh, what I was saying and to share with people because they couldn't understand me at times. And they say the first words that that I said, it, it wasn't mom, it wasn't dad, it was teacher, you know, and uh, because my my foster mom, she was actually teaching me things and um, and I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for that and I'm grateful for the environment they gave us and the care that they gave us and um, they did the best they could. They were New Order Mennonites. They had five children of their own. <clears throat> and uh, I grew up on a hog farm. But I always knew there was, I was different. I always knew that, you know, I always, I always knew that my sister and I belonged together. But I knew that we really didn't belong to that cell, to that group of people where we were staying. And I always had some thoughts going on in my mind. Well, like, I know these people aren't my brothers and sisters, and I know that the adults taking care of us aren't my parents. So where are my parents, right? And I had a lot of whys, like, why don't I have parents? Uh, why am I a foster child? Um, why am I living here? Uh, why is my skin a bit darker? And, you know, eventually I came to terms that that why I don't have parents is because I was such a bad child that they gave me away, that they gave us away. I know today that that, that is not true, but and with that being said, when you're when you're young, you, you have to try to. To have some kind of closure and the only closure I could get was was uh, thinking about, you know, I came up with my own solution as to why I didn't have parents. And I carried that with me for a very long time. I, I struggled in school. Um, it was hard in school. I didn't enjoy school. And uh, and eventually I became a bully. Uh, because I was I was feeling so much pain on my own. 
that I wanted the other children to experience a little bit of what I was feeling. I know today that that uh, that that's not right. But that's where I was. And today when I when I spend time and, and I process and I reflect and I pray, I, I pray for those ones that, that I've wronged. I pray for for those children that um, that I bullied in school and um, and I hope that that's enough because I think that uh, people are still, you know, as adults, maybe carrying some of the effects of, of, of what I put them through as, as being children. I was a runner. I was always running away um, from the farm. When I'd run away, they would have to call the police. Uh, I'd end up in a group home. I'd end up in a youth detention center. Eventually, I would make it. <coughs> excuse me, back to the back to the farm. And uh, and it was hard. But reflecting back, I don't think I was really running away. I think I was running too. I think I was running to find a connection. I think I was running to find belonging. I think I was running to find an understanding of, of who I am. Before I go any further, I'm going to um, I'm going to light up some medicine. I'm going to light up some uh, some sage, and and we're going to do a virtual smudge. I do this for for the ones watching and I, and I do it for myself. This is this is a daily practice that I that I have and and it helps put me in a place mm -hmm. where I can um, where I can share. Because sometimes when I share it's it's triggering for me and it mm -hmm. and it takes me back to a, a time in my life that that was very hard and reconnecting with my culture helped me to move forward in my life so as i light up this this medicine this sage i wash the medicine over my hands i wash it over my hands and i will uh thank you i'll uh i'll send some your way <laughs> And to the people who are watching, I wash it over my hands so that anything I touch or create during the day, I'll touch and create it in a good way and in a kind way. And then bring the, the medicine and I, I bring it to my eyes. I cleanse my eyes so that as I see things throughout the day, I'll see things in a good way and in a kind way. And then bring the, the medicine and the smoke and I wash it over my ears. I wash it over my ears so that as I hear things throughout the day, I'll be able to filter them and hear good things and try to not hear bad things. Then I wash the smoke over the top of my head. I wash it over the top of my head so that any thoughts that I have will be good thoughts and they'll be kind thoughts. I then pull the smoke, I bring it into my throat. I pull it into my throat so that when I speak, I say kind words and that when I speak, I have a strong voice. It took me many, many years to find my voice because I was shy, I was insecure, I had no confidence and I was lost and I was broken. I then pull that smoke into my heart. I pull it into my heart so that I have empathy. And I have love for myself and I have love for others. Then I pull that smoke. I pull it right into my core. I pull it into my core so I can stay centered as I come out here as a helper and do the work that I do. And then I wash that smoke down each leg wash the smoke down each leg so that I can remember how sacred life is and how sacred each step is as I walk on Mother Earth. 
And then I raise some smoke up to the crater and I push some smoke down to Mother Earth. And that helps me to be able to do what I do. And I have some, some other medicine here. It's some dried lavender and uh, it smells amazing. I like to uh, add it into my smudge. And it helps to put me at ease. I don't know if you've ever tried uh, burning lavender, dried lavender. It smells amazing. The first mm -hmm. time that I was, uh, first time that I, I was able to smell it was in a sweat lodge. And uh, it just, I said, you know what? It, it, it connected with me. And there's certain medicines that connect with us. And when we find that connection, those medicines are are the medicines that that we're supposed to use at certain times. So growing up hard, 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 lots of trouble, lots of dysfunction, um, group homes, detention centers uh, would make it back to to the farm where I grew up um, constantly running away and and looking for something that wasn't there. And that was that was identity. I was angry, I was lost, I was broken. And, and I can remember this, this one day when my sister and I um, were walking down, we got, we, were, uh, we got off the, uh, the school bus and we were walking home down the country road. And you know, it's in the summertime and you always play, you explore as children. And, and uh, we were walking and, and uh, we were exploring this one ditch and we found half a case of beer. Um, we did not have any alcohol in our home. Um, it was, uh, there was, there was no alcohol. There was no cigarettes. No one smoked. And when my sister and I found this half a case of, of Labatt's blue little stubby Pilsner bottles in, in the ditch, we, um, we looked at each other and, and I don't know how this happened, but we managed to get the, the, the tops off of a couple of these these beers and uh, and I drank them and she drank them and after I had about two beers all of a sudden all that uneasiness all of those whys all of that anger everything just went away and I was about eight years old eight or nine years old and and I knew that whatever liquid was in that little brown bottle that would help me cope Mm -hmm. and and that would um that would take away all of the unanswered things that that I was going through in my life and uh and it helped me so with that being said um that led to me um trying other things and and uh you know doing other recreational stuff but that's not why I'm here and I'm not going to talk about that right now because that um, that doesn't help anybody. Was there, like, I know for a lot of Indigenous people who are disconnected um, from their culture, they, I guess, like, face a wall at some point where they're like, you know, this is where I need to be. Like, they, they see themselves in the mirror and they're like, you know, my culture and these teachings and ceremony, this is who I'm meant to be. And this is what I'm meant to do with my life. Was there ever a moment or like a, a time in your life where you sort of reached that wall or reached that period where you're like, I'm safe. And this is, you know, this is the path that I see myself on. Um, and, you know, life from here is going to get much better. Um, has that ever sort of happened to you? Or have you ever sort of like finally reached a point where you're like, I'm, I'm in a good place now. And this is where, like, this is what, you know, I'm, I'm meant to do in life. Finding that good place, Alana, took me many years. Mm -hmm. Finding that good road, that good path to be on, it took trial and error. Uh, I've been down so many paths, um, and I'm happy that I made it um, out of some of the situations I was in. 
The only thing that has ever been really constant in my life was shame. Mm. Shame of being a foster child and not knowing who my parents were. And then when I connected with my culture, the shame was there again. The shame was there because <clears throat> I would be in certain situations around other indigenous people and I wouldn't know anything because I wasn't brought up with the teachings. I wasn't brought up with the ceremonies. I wasn't brought up with the songs. And I really don't look indigenous. I, you know, so there was a time in my life when I knew that I finally found purpose, meaning, and direction. And I knew that I was on the right road. Mm -hmm. I knew that, that, that I was on the right path and I knew that I was on the red road and, and I knew I was slowly being connected to culture. I had to go find that path. I had to go ask those people to help me. I, and, and it was hard because I wasn't accepted at the beginning. Mm -hmm. I was not accepted, but I didn't give up. I didn't give up. I, I persevered. You know, when, when I can, when I reflect back, there was school, um, there was drugs, there was alcohol. I was a functioning addict. Um, I was incarcerated at a very young age. Uh, the only thing that was constant in my life was my sister. She was always there, um, thick or thin. I did marry my high school sweetheart. Um, I was only in high school for a couple months. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and then I was incarcerated. And then we moved in together. And I had a few really not bad jobs. And then I found a job where I worked at and I stayed with them for uh, 12 years. Um, bought a house, got married. I was a I was a functioning addict. And because of all those things that I experienced in my life, I had so many holes burnt into my heart. That was the analogy that I could use. And because of all the things that that happened in in my family, not only on my dad's side with the residential schools, but also on my mom's side with um, dysfunction and addiction. The best analogy that I can I can give is that, you know, when when I was very young. Can you see this? Yep. It's a bundle. It's a bundle that I carry today. But when I was very young, there was a bundle that was handed down to me from generations before me, mm. from both sides of my parents. That bundle that was handed down to me, you know, it, it had dysfunction, it had oppression, it had addiction, it had abuse, it had greed, it had everything that no child or anybody should should have to carry. Mm -hmm. And when I was very young, that was gifted to me. And it said, here, carry this to the best of your ability. This is from the generations before you, and now it's yours. It wasn't until I was 45 years old that I put the dope away and I put the plug in the jug um, in regards to alcohol. And it took all my strength to ask for help because I knew I could not do this on my own. And I knew that if I stayed on the path that I was on, it would just be a matter of time until um, I would make that journey to the next world. Mm -hmm. Because alcohol and drugs was really starting to hit me hard and I was caught hard in the grips of addiction. In time, I was able to unpack that dysfunctional bundle and I was able to, to, to put things in it, like, like identity. I was able to put in things like 
songs and culture and teachings and and purpose meaning and direction and i was i was able to to in time also to be able to answer the questions of who i am why i am and what is my purpose in life and as as indigenous people when we're on that good road when we have that when we when we've made that connection from from here to here from our head to our heart we should be able to answer those questions right and mm -hmm. it took me a long time to be able to answer those questions um who am i i am kiwe tinwe in the nay that translates into north wind men when the north wind comes what do people do we go inside we go inside to share exactly what we're doing right now mm -hmm. we, we you know we go into our lodges uh we go into our homes we invite people over we share our stories we share our teachings and we invest why am i here um i'm here to instill positive change big or small in myself in the community that i live in and in creation and what is my purpose in life? My purpose in life is to bring people together. Uh, to bring people together, to, to walk down a road of understanding as equals. And, and when I say bring people together, I mean bring all people together. Bring, bring the white, the black, the yellow, the red. Um, bring everyone together. Because through my eyes, um, we're all equals. And if you go far enough back in all of our history, a lot of our stories run parallels. A lot of our stories run parallels with, with a lot of our creation stories are almost the same, right? And, and when I bring people together, I'm here to, to talk, to educate, to, to, to have that unity in the circle. I'm not here to blame. I'm not here to shame. Yeah, we're, we we might have some some hard discussions. We might have to lean into those those hard talks. But it's about bringing people together and giving them a space where everybody can can find their voice and mm -hmm. everybody can have a sense of belonging and everybody can be connected. Right. Yeah. And and life it's 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 hard and especially what we're going through right now with COVID. Oh my mm -hmm. goodness. It's it's a new way of looking at things and 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 it's very challenging for, for some people. And some people say, well, you know, I'm I'm struggling with or I'm or I'm depressed because I can't get out, I can't meet with people. But that's where we have to get creative, right? Mm -hmm. There's there's so many different ways to feed our spirits. And and getting outside. And, and being on the land and being near the water or in a bush or, you know, taking a, a walk with a friend, you know, um, a social distancing walk. There's so many things we can do yeah, right? yeah. Because, because we believe that that Mother Earth has everything that we need um, to become well again. Right. And, and what we do as indigenous people, when someone strays off that good path in life, we don't push them away. We don't we don't shun them. We don't stereotype them. We don't um, lock them up. What we do as family and as as community is that uh, we surround them and we take them back out to the land. Yeah, and that's why I, I think that land based um, connections are so important. And, and it's not only for us as indigenous people, it, it's for everybody in general, because, you know, we we forgot what it's like to 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 hear when you're out on the land to see to feel to smell we forgot what it's like to have that connection because today everything's so fast everybody's moving so fast everything's so convenient you know and before we know it really um how many winters do we have left to make a change to make an impact on creation, yeah. not society. 
And that's what I feel my role is. My role here is is to um, is to bring people together, um, to take them out to the land, and to to get them reconnected, right? Yeah. Right. And I also want to talk about reconciliation. That's that's also a big part. You know, I think the time is ripe right now to to have those difficult discussions. I know that people want to get involved with reconciliation, but they don't really know how what their role can be. Or, or how can they initiate that? I know yeah. that there's a lot of faith-based groups that want to have those conversations, but they're very, very cautious about how they approach the, the Indigenous people because, you know what, um, uh, some of us are still uh, very angry about what we were subjected to um, for many generations, and we're still dealing with those effects. Yeah. And it's going to take seven generations for us to heal from that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's tough because I know a lot of non-Indigenous people who want to help and participate in reconciliation, but they're almost, like, scared. Like, they just don't know, what, like, what to do. And, um, and it's hard, you know, working for the city, working for the university, working in places where it's dominated by non-Indigenous people. But, you know, everyone genuinely wants to help. But... There's no like, you know, written guideline on how to be an ally or how to support Indigenous people or how to participate in reconciliation. So I feel like everyone's sort of figuring it out right now. And, and you know, there's certain people in our communities that are willing to take risky sort of strides in helping Indigenous people. And, you know, that's, that's great. Um, and then there's other people who are willing to support um, in, in a more, I guess, like low key way where we have this whole community of people who are willing to take action and then people who are willing to support. Um, and in my work anyways, that's what I see. There's people who know more than I do and they're not indigenous and they've done so much work, um, so much good work and they've done so much to educate themselves and others. And I'm like following their lead because I, again, was also disconnected and, and didn't grow up in my culture. And I don't know a lot of, you know, a lot of things that go on in our communities, but I look to these people a lot. Um, and also, you know, having people who are there to support, even if they don't necessarily know how to participate in reconciliation, it still makes such a difference to know that people want to help. Um, yeah. And that's why that's why I always carry this. This is part of part of part of the bundle, right? This is this is a little teddy bear with with a medicine wheel on them, and it was it was a gift. I carry that to represent the innocence of life. I carry that to 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 acknowledge a time in our history that was very dark. I carry that to acknowledge the the children that were in the residential schools. I carry that to acknowledge the ones that that didn't come back from the residential schools. I have a cousin of mine who's who's a traditional man who's who's he's probably in his mid seventies, who was uh, at Shingwak. Uh, my family um, was at Shingwak, which is now Algoma University. Right. right? Um, he said when he was ready, he had to go back to that place where he was dropped off as a child. And he's a grown man. He had to go back and retrieve that little boy who was still there crying and wondering what happened to him and where his family is. Um, and he said that was the way that he could make that connection to his inner child mm -hmm. and bring him back into himself. Because I find that one of my coping strategies uh, growing up was to disconnect. Because that's, that's, that's all that I knew. And when we disconnect at a young age, we leave pieces of us in, in these certain places where we disconnect, yeah. right? For an example, uh, where, where I, I had that first experience with alcohol, I went back there and I laid some tobacco down and, and, and I said some prayers. Mm -hmm. Two, acknowledge that time and if there was a little piece of me back there to reconnect with it. Mm -hmm. The places where, where I ran away, um, uh, 
the farm is still there, but the family's not there. I went back to that laneway and I put some tobacco down mm -hmm. to try to reconnect and, and try to uh, make that connection and bring that little boy back to me. Yeah. And, and this is so hard work, but and nobody can do this work for us. Mm -hmm. Right. Our lives revolve, revolve around prayer. And, and when we use tobacco, which was the first medicine that was gifted to us, it keeps us connected to the spirit, keeps yeah. us connected to the spirit of the creator. As soon as we pray with tobacco and that goes on the ground, it automatically opens up a channel from this world to the next world. Mm -hmm. And you can say that, um, you know, that's a phone line and, uh, and it's never busy. Right. <laughs> and then when we pray with tobacco and we put it into a fire, as soon as that ignites, it takes our prayers up. Right. Yeah. And tobacco is one of the most in, most most important medicines uh, that we have. And it was the first medicine that was gifted to us. And, and it, the prayer is so powerful. I, I it's I believe in the power of prayer and it's very rarely that I will pray for myself. I'm always praying forward. I'm praying for I'm praying for the lost. I'm praying for the ones who are broken. I'm praying for the ones who are suffering. I'm praying for the water. I'm praying for the air. I'm praying for the ones who are out there making a difference. Because I know people behind me are praying forward and they're praying yeah. for me, right? So it's it's always it's always a, a circle, right? That's that that just keeps on connecting. Yeah. Connecting and connecting and connecting. And that's what my life is about. My life is just about going back and, and connecting circles. You know, um, being brought up by the Mennonites, I had to go to church. Uh, you know, it was mandatory, even if I didn't uh, find it fulfilling. And, and what do I do uh, 40 years later? I go back to that church and, and I stand up there and I tell them my story. Mm -hmm. Right. And 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 then, you know, when I was homeless, I was homeless for uh, for eight years on the streets of Kitchener, Waterloo, after my marriage fell apart. And uh, what do I do? I go back to that shelter where I used to stay and and I talk to them. Right. And I share my story there because I think that whatever I experienced or the story of what I was going through actually might help and connect with some of the men that are staying there. And then eventually I got a job there and I stayed at the House of Friendship for six and a half years. Mm -hmm. um, going um, back into the court system, you know, uh, drug court. I, I can remember what did I do um, because I was so insecure and I was shy. I had no confidence. Once I found my voice, I wanted to start using it. So I started public speaking. Mm -hmm. So then I went into drug court, into the court system. And every time I went into the courts, it was not a positive experience. Mm -hmm. So when I walked in there to share my story, I was triggered. I was triggered. I was triggered. I was triggered. And I couldn't shake it. I couldn't slow it down. I had a tobacco tie. I was praying. I just could not slow my mind down. So, uh, what did I do? I stood up there in the courtroom and, and I told them how I was feeling, what I was thinking and what I needed. Mm -hmm. You know, what am I feeling right now? I am scared, I'm anxious and I want to run because I'm a runner. I said, I want to run through those doors and take right off. Um, you know, what am I thinking? I'm thinking that um, I don't want to be here, but what do I need? I need to share my story. Yeah. Because the more I share it, the less power it has over me. Mm -hmm. Because I've experienced some pretty traumatic things. And I've done some pretty bad things to people too. Mm -hmm. But I'm not that person anymore. Right? I have changed so much that now um, I know what it's like to love. Mm -hmm. Now I know what it's like to have compassion. Now I know what it's like to to be humble. Now I know what it's like to, to be honest, right? Mm -hmm. and, and before it was just that I had different ways of coping with life. Right? Yeah. But I, I, I can seriously say that, that making a connection with, with my culture, um, with the indigenous side really helped me with, um, 
being a visionary. Mm -hmm. you know, looking at gaps, looking at ways that that uh, I can possibly make creation a better place. And that's what uh, that's what I'm doing now. Um, been working on a book for over six years, trying to get that out of the way. And um, also uh, looking into land-based teaching and land-based um, healing. Mm. You know, uh, That's the Crow amazing. Yeah, with the Crow Shield Lodge. Um, it's been in the works for about three years now. And, uh, and it's a place, you know, today I have a basic understanding that to be broken is to be ordinary. I believe that everybody is broken in one way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. uh, some people will talk about their brokenness, and some people won't, and that's totally okay. When I came to terms with my brokenness, the shame was lifted, and I was able to start working on things that I buried so deep down inside of me that were controlling my life. Um, that weren't mine to carry, mm -hmm. right? And I did that through the help of uh, going away to an indigenous treatment center, right? Um, they they helped with uh, trauma release therapy, which was so great. And then oh, I went yeah. to a healing lodge outside of uh, London, Ontario, which was so great. And then um, I came back and I started working on some goals. And uh, remember when I said I, I was only in high school for a very limited time. Mm -hmm. Well, I had to go back and the first goal that I wanted to work on was getting my grade 12. And uh, and I can remember, I uh, I walked an hour and a half to get to uh, St. Louis Adult Learning. The closer I got, the more anxious I got. Mm -hmm. Because I'm a runner, I wanted to run. But I had tools now and I slowed things down and I stood there and I said to myself, Clarence, you can run like you've always done or you could stay accountable to this commitment that you've made and do whatever it takes to attain your grade 12 diploma. Mm -hmm. First day was hard. The hardest, I remember I had a migraine because I was so stressed and, and I'm walking in there and there's, uh, I felt totally out of place. Each day got easier, each day got easier. I made some 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 relationships there where, where people were there for the same reason I was. And then in three months, I, uh, I got my diploma and it felt so good. Mm -hmm. to to uh, to accomplish what I started and to finish what I started yeah and and then I did some upgrading and then and then a while later I went away to college for two years for a social service worker um, with indigenous knowledge before that I worked in warehouses I was always a shipper receiver um, I was a lead hand and I was just a number and I was uh, I wanted to change because I knew deep in my heart that I wanted to help people. Yeah. And I, I wanted to give back and I wanted to uh, to be there to acknowledge all the ones who have helped me. And I wanted to finally be in a situation where I was able to help others. But I knew the only way that I could do that is if I first helped myself. Mm -hmm. that, that was hard because I had to go back and the only way that I could really move forward is to go back and look at all of the things that I've experienced and the whys, answer those whys, but then also go back even farther and um, and have an understanding of what, you know, what, what my family, um, the hardships and the sorrows that they've worked through. Yeah. You know, in order for me to be here today. And, and I had to be able to to acknowledge that time, but also to be grateful, yeah. right? That um, because if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, today I'm I'm connected to my to my family, to my to my uncles, to my cousins, to my aunts, and uh, on on both sides. 
and maybe my parents aren't here um, because I did meet my biological parents when I was 20 years old. And that was an experience. Um, I had very mixed feelings about that. It mm -hmm. was something that I always wanted to happen. But when that day came, I was very, um, I was angry. Mm -hmm. I was very angry. Uh, but it's, I was angry because I didn't have an understanding of what they experienced. Mm -hmm. And once I found out what they experienced, that anger went away, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and that love slowly started to come in, right? I spent 16 years with my mother and 18 years with my dad and, and they were, they were good times. They were good times getting to know them, hearing their stories. And then, um, that's why I wanted to uh, write the book, you know, share some of those those things that, that they shared with me. And then my dad always used to call me Crow Shield um, before I got my spirit name. Mm. The crow is big in our family. It's like our family totem um, animal. So when we were um, developing the lodge, uh, somebody said, well, what can what can we put before the lodge. So I said, what about Crow Shield? Because my dad used to call me that and I'd like to honor that. And they said, Clarence, yeah, let's do it. So so that's that's the name of the uh, the uh, the organization that I'm working on right now. Um, it's all about land based healing and land based teaching. It's amazing. It is amazing. It is amazing. You know, um, the whole thing is that we're so resilient. We're more resilient than than we believe we are, right? Yep. And and we've been through so much um, as as so many nations have been displaced. So many nations have been put down. So many nations have have experienced so much. But they still have that hope. They still have um, their teachings. They still have that connection. Yeah. They still have that connection to to creation. You know, regardless of of all the horrific things that have happened. And that's that's why I carry this. Carry this. I don't know if you can see this. Yeah. But uh, what it wow. is? It's it's a replica warriors club. I oh, carry wow. that club to represent the warrior in each and every one of us. Um, a warrior to me is someone who puts the needs of others before their, their own needs. A warrior to me is someone who speaks for those that don't have a voice. A warrior to me is someone who watches out for the water, watches out for the land, watches out for the environment, watches out for the children, watches out for the elders. And a warrior is someone who has a good heart and a good mind. Mm -hmm. And there's so many warriors amongst us who are willing to um, bring on some, some good positive change. And they say that uh, that the youth are going to be the ones that are really going to have an impact and, and are going to, you know, pick up that flame and they're going to walk with that flame and they're going to make some big changes mm -hmm. in creation and in our communities. And that makes my heart feel so good. Yeah, me too. You know, and they are They're You know, they they they've had enough. And a lot of them, you know, when when you talk about climate change and all of this stuff, they're saying like, what have, look at all this damage that has happened up until today. Mm -hmm. And why has that damage happened? And then no one yeah. wants to talk about it. The impacts that it's having, not only on creation, but on plants, on animals, on the water, on the air, on the environment. And, and I can remember that, um, you know, I, I'd sit and I'd, talk to my cousin, my cousin Johnny, and he would say that, you know, the worst disease that ever came to man 
was the disease of greed. Mm. It influences people in, in, in a very, very harmful way. Yeah. It, it, it drives them. It, it consumes them. They, they get their blinders on and, and they will go after and they will do anything um, to benefit themselves. Right? Yeah. Greed is unfortunately such a driving force in in a lot of things, unfortunately. Like, you know, it, it leads to theft and and hurt and pain. Um, but yeah, greed is definitely a disease in itself. Yeah. I'm I'm always concerned too about about housing. About housing. You know, mm -hmm. there's there's a lot of homelessness going on right now. There's there's the um opioid uh stuff going on the fentanyl stuff going on uh i'm so glad that uh, that wasn't around and that um i didn't uh gravitate towards that and with that being said um you know there's there's spirits that are leaving us and and because of what's going on with the pandemic people aren't having the opportunity to grieve properly. Mm -hmm. um, when, when we talk about gatherings or funerals, uh, there's only five or 10 people allowed to, uh, to attend. And, and what is that? How does that affect somebody when they can't grieve or when they can't go through those stages, mm -hmm. when they don't have that opportunity for closure? Yeah, you know, and that that has had a big impact on the indigenous people as well, because, you know, we we have certain ceremonies that happen when somebody passes. Yeah, you know, the the, the sacred fires get lit. Um, they, they burn for four days. You know, people are coming in um, to to make their offerings of tobacco and uh, and they're there to 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 celebrate that person's life. Well, that hasn't been able to happen. Yeah. So how are people processing that? How are they getting closure from that? And um, I don't know what the the, the effects are going to be mm -hmm. if and when this is, is all over. Yeah. You know, it's uh, it's a hard, hard thing for, for many of us to, to process and, and mm -hmm. to work. But that's where we have faith. That's where we have our beliefs. That's where we can, we can, we can connect and, and we can stay connected um, virtually, I guess. Mm -hmm. And we're always connected. We're always connected. <laughs> it's, you know, we just have to go outside and, and look around and look yeah. at uh, everything that we're connected to. Right, we're connected to the two-legged, to the four-legged, to the wing ones, to the swimmers, to the crawlers. We're connected to the four winds. Like like today, you feel that that wind on you, and it feels so refreshing. Um, I enjoy it. Um, <laughs> we're connected to all living plants. We're connected to the trees. We have the same DNA as a tree. We're connected to everything around us because we believe everything has a spirit, mm -hmm. and we want to acknowledge that spirit. Yeah. And that's why when when we take something from creation, we only take what we need. But before we take anything, we always give an offering. Mm -hmm. We give an offering of tobacco. Now, um, for example, uh, when I go fishing, uh, I pray to the water, I pray to the fish, and, and I make an offering of tobacco. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that helps me, sometimes that doesn't, right? Yeah. But it's to have that intent, it's to have that teaching. Mm -hmm. that, um, that is that's what we do um, yeah because that's how interconnected we are to everything yeah you know? and and that's what i really feel so grateful about you know um to have the teachings that i know and to um to use them and to practice them and yeah. to apply them right the men we have we have a responsibility to to tend the fire and the women have the responsibility to uh, to walk with the water. Now, 
Now, the men have to make sure that uh, we don't boil the women's waters. <laughs> and the women have to make sure that their water doesn't put out our fires. Mm-hmm. Right? So yeah. we all have different roles. We all have different responsibilities. And but that's what creation is about. Because with, with, with the masculine and the feminine, when they two come together, that's when they create something really beautiful. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's, that's how... That's how I'm here today. That's how you're here today. And that's how everybody is here today that's that's mm-hmm. watching this. Yeah. Right? So yeah, I'm merging I'm those worlds. Yep. Yeah. But um, I'm so glad you're here and so glad that you're able to share um, these teachings with us. Like, I just got so many chills from hearing your stories and hearing, you know, how resilient you are and how you're continuing to push for that resiliency in our communities. And um, these stories are so important. And and I know it's just a fraction of who you are. And I know I'm just starting like to get to know you, but I'm really glad that you're here to tell these stories and for people to meet you and, you know, know who you are. Um, And especially for after COVID, like, you know, you're so intrinsic to our community and you're always there and you're always, you know, singing and, and giving teachings. And I'm, I'm really glad that you and I can connect this way and share these teachings with others so that post COVID people can, can meet you and hear your stories in person. Um, but until then we'll take your teachings and go out on the land and feel connection and, you know, go back to certain times in their lives where they have to, you know, get that closure. And I feel like a lot of what you shared is so like useful for people who are struggling right now um, and coming to terms with their trauma and pain. Um, and it's really useful for even myself. Like I, have never really heard that we should be going back to these places that hurt us. You know, we're, we're taught to run from them and to distance ourselves and not to, you know, trigger ourselves, but going back could also be really powerful too. Like, especially if, you know, there's a certain place that you tie so much pain to, like, you know, a grandparent's house or, or somewhere that, you know, you've been hurt or have, have been traumatized or whatever it is, going back to these places can be very powerful and relieving. Um, and yeah, I just really appreciate you sharing that. And, and it's encouraging to hear that, you know, we can all come full circle, um, regardless of the pain and trauma that we've sort of faced in our childhood or in our life, we can come full circle and deal with these things and move on in a good way and share those stories. Um, so you're just such an inspiring person and I'm just so glad that, um, you're willing to share that with us and, um, all the teachings that you have because they're so important. Um, so thank you. And the thing is, we don't have to do any of this alone. Mm -hmm, Exactly. Even even when we feel alone, we're never alone because the creator and our ancestors and our spirit helpers, they're always with us. Yeah. And, and if you just sometimes you, you can see little things that that show us that that we're never alone or something comes to us in our dreams. Right. Yeah. And, and we're all beautiful people. That's what I had to tell myself and that. And I'm still telling myself that. Yeah, because I am. And sometimes I forget about that. We all have gifts. Sometimes it takes us a, a while to to find out what those gifts are mm-hmm. um i have the gift i think of bringing people together and and to talk yeah. um that's really strange because i have never seen myself as someone who likes to talk <laughs> um <laughs> and with that being said people say no clarence that was good you know um we appreciate what you do but we all have gifts and it's it's to share those gifts. It's it's to it's to find out what those gifts are and to let everybody else know and to yeah. be a part of it and, yeah. and and to give give those gifts away freely. You know, I'm going to I'm going to share a teaching that'll that'll go into a song. OK. This is an eagle feather. <coughs> Excuse me. There was a time in our history, a long time ago, when um, a lot of our nations were at war. They were um, they were fueled by greed. They were very dysfunctional. They weren't following any teachings 
like the ones we follow today of the seven grandfathers, they were disconnected from their hearts. And this is not why the creator brought man to creation. They were killing each other. They were stealing. And the eagle is the one that takes our prayers to the creator. The eagle is the one that sits beside the creator and has conversation. And because of what creation has come to at that time, the creator was talking to the eagle and he says, this is not why I brought man to creation. This is not what I intended them to do or how them to be. So the creator said, I'm really contemplating about wiping everything out and starting all over again. Megazed, the eagle, said, I hear you, but can you give me four days, four days to fly out over creation to see if anybody is living with the original teachings of honesty, humility, truth, bravery, wisdom, love, and respect, and to see if anybody is connected from their heads to their hearts. So the first day, Megase, the eagle, flew out to the east. Megase flew far, Megase flew hard, he couldn't find anybody living with those teachings or living that intended way of life. The second day, Megaze flew out over to the south. He flew hard. He flew farther and he still couldn't find anybody. And he looked. The third day, Megaze flew to the west. He was hoping somebody would be in the west because that's where our ancestors are, in that western doorway. But he couldn't find anybody living. All he could find was dysfunction. And then the fourth day, when Megaze was flying in the north, he saw some, some smoke coming up from a fire. So Megaze flew down to see where that smoke was coming from. And he could see a village. He could see people living off the land in harmony. He could see the women preparing, working in the gardens. You could see the men bringing some, some wild game back. You could see people by the water. He could see lodges. He could see people making offerings. You could see a grandfather sitting on the banks of the shore and a river going by. He could see his grandsons staying there and, and they were lifting a pipe. Megaze could see that they were living the life that we were intended to live. So the ego, Megaze, flew back to the Creator. And he said, Creator, Great Spirit, I have found somebody who is living with the intended life that you hope they would live. They are living with the original teachings. They are living in harmony with the land. They are connected. They are making offerings. They are doing ceremony. So the creator did not wipe anything out. And it's from the work that Megaze did, the eagle did, 
that we have what we have today. So there's many songs about the ego. There's ceremonies about the ego. And the eagle is one of the most sacred things we have in our culture with our teachings. So I'm going to sing an eagle song. I'm going to sing a song about Megaze. And this song talks about hearing the eagle, seeing the eagle, and taking the eagle with us in our hearts. The eagle has vision. The eagle has strength. And the eagle is always watching over us. So with awareness and mindfulness, we can see the eagle. We can see those teachings. We can be those teachings. We can take those teachings with us. That was beautiful. Thanks, Clarence. 
we are beautiful. Today is really beautiful. are. We are. Yep. We are beautiful people. We have so much to give, and if if we can all just come together, you know, for 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 a common common understanding, you know that you know we we need to um, well we don't need to do anything, but creation is beautiful. We are beautiful, and uh, our ceremony ceremonies are beautiful. We all have gifts. We're all special, and together we can make a difference, right? You know? Yeah. I'm just I'm happy that you're doing this. This is so great, um, you know, because that's what we do. We come together in the winter times. We tell stories. We share. It's it's about investing in the next generations, right? Yeah. yeah. You know. And I'm so I'm grateful so that you were willing to participate and share all your knowledge and stories from your past. And um, yeah, I'm so grateful for you. And thank you so much for participating in this. Um, I'm sure people will love to hear about you and meet you. And yeah, again, I can't wait for post COVID so that we can all come together and um, celebrate and and immerse ourselves back into culture. Yeah, I, I'm grateful for, um, for where I'm at right now. I, I feel connected to this region. I feel a sense of belonging. And this is where I want to make a difference. Um, I feel that this is where I'm needed and 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 I love it here. As uh, as strange as that may seem, um, I I do really um, have a sense of belonging and and I'm very grateful for that, right? I, I think that uh, regardless of what happened, how I was displaced, uh, I think I was supposed to end up here for a reason um, because this is where I want to make a change and this is where I want to bring people together where we can um, work at things together, uh, yeah. where we can unite and we can make a difference and we can start, you know, trying to um, Maybe not heal, but we can have some conversations about about the past mm -hmm. and about our certain roles. I just know that, you know, one of the main things that we really struggle with is is having land to, to do our own ceremonies. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like it's sometimes we have to beg to 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 borrow someone's land and you know, um, and then, you know, we have to buy all of these things where before everything was just so available to us. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know but that's why we're here. We're here to to maybe make that possible again and, and to have those conversations to, to start that dialogue about, um, you know, uh, how can we make the impossible possible? Yeah. Right? Absolutely. Yeah, hard conversations, but hopefully we're we're all working in the same direction and, you know, having youth and knowledge keepers and storytellers to all support one another in this journey is really important. And as a young person, I feel so supported by this community, um, including by you. And I'm really grateful that, you know, you've helped me in my work um, and participated and, you know, helped me when I needed it, um, shared teaching. So really grateful for that. And um, yeah, we're all moving together um, in a good way, I think. And I'm excited to see um, where things go in our work. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, Perfect. but thank you so much again, Clarence. Um, I'm really excited to share this with everyone and, and this was such a wonderful um, time together and I'm glad that you um, were able to participate and share knowledge and I'm sure it was you know, really needed a lot of a lot of people probably really needed to hear these words and um, teachings and songs. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and yeah, I hope you have a great rest of your weekend and day and uh, you inspired me to go get out on the land and go for a nice walk. So I'm going to do that um, and remember okay. some of the teachings that you shared. But yeah, thank you again. OK, thanks for making this all possible. Right. You're welcome. I, I wish you well on everything that you do. I'm glad you're a part of our community and I'm glad you're doing what you're doing because what you're doing is bringing people together. Thanks, Clarence. I needed to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, if we're done, I'm going to say, uh, that means uh, thank you in Cree. 
I'd like to thank you for your time. I'd like to thank everybody who's watching this for their time. I believe the best gift we can give anybody is a gift of our time. Yeah. So I would like to say uh, thank you, Miigwech and Skomatin, and wish everybody well on their day, on their life. And remember, you're beautiful. <laughs> Thanks, Clarence. All right. Take care. Take care. Bye.